Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to the Brainy Boomer Lecture Series. We're so very happy that you've all joined us today. In 2007, the McGill University Research Center for Studies in Aging, or the MTSA Education Committee, started the Brainy Boomer Lecture Series in order to suggest practical steps to both improve and maintain brain health, as well as to promote healthy lifestyle choices amongst the most populous generation in history. The MCSA Education Committee, which was founded in 1996, has three main objectives. Identifying education needs of healthcare providers, seniors, caregivers, and the public, and to develop responses to meet some of their needs. To enhance the positive image of the aging process by addressing stereotypes and myths about aging. And finally, the dissemination of research on aging. Today, our guest is Dr. Daphne Namiash, who is acting president of the Handicapped Life Dignity and affiliate member of the McGill University Research Center for Studies in Aging. She is also a member of and former chair of the McGill University Research Center for Studies in Aging's Education Committee. I'd now like to invite Dr. Namiash to start her presentation, Ageism at a Glance. So today I have the great pleasure of uh, coming to McGill once again and uh, meeting with 44 people. You are my top number since I've been giving these ageism workshops, I was actually um, asked to do this by an organization called Observatory on Aging and Society. This uh, particular organization is mainly French, practically all French actually. And they, they got a government grant to be able to develop a program about ageism. So a lot of the work, most of the work has been done by the organization itself. But um, the New Horizons grant uh, and the observatory wanted also to be able to offer it to all of the English communities in Quebec. So I have been uh, able to do it by Zoom. That's one good thing about the pandemic. I was able to reach uh, many, uh, this is the 21st uh, presentation that I've been doing actually in uh, not all through McGill, but through the observatory mainly. Um, across the whole of Quebec, in Gaspé, and uh, I didn't even realize there were so many English communities actually across the province. So um, today we will be talking about this in great detail and sensitizing you hopefully about ageism. Next, please. This is just a, a minute to talk about what the observatory is about. It's a nonprofit organization. Shh. Partnered with the Institut Universitaire de Gériatrie de Montréal, the mission of the organization is to improve the life of seniors and to address the challenges caused by ageism and its impact on our society. The vision is to be an important reference in the field of aging provoking reflection, and it's managed by retired or pre-retired volunteers who serve on an advisory committee and board of directors. I want to mention this because um, it's, I think, the only organization that I know about uh, with, in Quebec which only concentrates on the problem of ageism as such, uh, which I thought was an interesting uh, feature of the organization, and they've done quite a lot of research. Next, please. So they publish a monthly, a bi-monthly newsletter or the Gérofar, which some of you might be interested in uh, getting, it's free. And it has some very interesting articles, including one of our articles about ageism in it. Next, please. So what are the main activities? I mentioned the fact that they carry out action research. So I want to mention in which areas they've been doing this work. They've done ageism in the workplace, ageism in the healthcare environment, Ageism in the media, women's words and Italian cuisine, which is not really about ageism. Ageism at a glance, which is this particular New Horizons grant program. And they just did uh, one on hearing problems and the pandemic. So this is basically what they're currently working on. But the uh, CADA program, the one on ageism awareness is the most important program that they're doing right now. It has been mentioned so much ageism in the pandemic. Uh, those of you who read the newspapers regularly and listen to the media on TV have heard that it's been talked about. Um, and we're gonna discuss more about that in a minute. Next, please. 
This is what we look like, the moderators. Thank you. Next, please. Ageism, today's workshop has uh, two objectives. To exchange about the phenomenon of ageism from illustrations, comic strips, and applying it to our personal experience. This is why I personally got involved in this project, because I liked the fact that they had put it in an easy way to understand and communicate it to people. And people have really enjoyed it so far. And I did send to you, I don't know if uh, Caitlin sent it to you already, but the uh, there are 24 different comic strips. And as you can see, there are 13 different areas within which uh, ageism has been found to be. And uh, I found it, I find it more, makes it more fun to discuss it and to become aware of, um, even though it's not exactly a pleasant thing to talk about. And the second one is to understand how to face ageism and to be able to counter it or prevent it. I'm gonna, at the end of the program, I'm gonna get five, five different uh, tips on how I think we should prevent it, even though it wasn't in the original project in French. But um, I feel that people also need to have some ideas about how we can prevent it. Next, please. So what is abuse? Because ageism is a form of abuse. And we're gonna talk about that in a second. My whole career has been practically about trying to prevent and treat, et cetera, and reduce abuse to older adults. And elder abuse occurs when a single or repetitive action or lack of appropriate action, whether it's intentional or unintentional, occurs in a relationship where there should be trust and causes harm or distress to a senior, an older person. Usually a senior is thought to be over the age of 60 or 65, depending on the research. Next, please. That quote comes from the Chair of Elder Abuse and also from a national study called NICE, the National Initiatives of Care for the Elderly, which is a very interesting uh, uh, Canadian program based in Toronto University. What is ageism? So the OAS defines ageism as a set of negative attitudes and biases towards seniors and aging. It's often irrational and ageism can lead to the marginalization and disempowerment of the elderly. In other words, feeling that you have no power, feeling that you're different, etc. Next, please. This has actually been also talked about in the United Nations. And the United Nations has, uh, feels that it's very important to pay particular attention in the world, basically, to abuse of older people, or elder abuse. We are trying not to use the word elder abuse now because elder is not a good uh, term for people who are indigenous. Um, so we usually call it senior abuse or mistreatment. So these are the types of abuse and I have given many lectures on this and for McGill, so you've probably heard me already. Physical and psychological abuse, neglect, and discrimination in all its forms, including ageism. In fact, there are more different kinds as well that I talk about in my uh, general lectures. Next, please. So ageism, which is a form of abuse of older adults is subtly manifested, and this is very important. How is it, how do we know that ageism exists? It's through pe what people believe, what their attitudes are, what behaviors that people have that exclude a person on the basis of their age. They result in oppression, discrimination, and even exclusion of the elderly, of older adults, I should say. Ageism is the racism and sexism related to age. So we've heard a lot in the past about sexism, particularly against women. We've heard a lot about racism in the last couple of years, in fact, and how much Black Lives Matter. And now we're looking at ageism, that older adults also matter. And uh, this is 
basically another form of abuse against older adults, as the others are a form of discrimination and oppression too. Next. Now we're going to have a very brief discussion, lasting about five minutes. You can time me if you want, uh, <laughs> please. Have you, uh, what is ageism? Have you witnessed or experienced a situation of ageism, discrimination against you or other people you know, or by society? Uh, how would you react or how have you reacted in such situations that have happened to you? And what should we learn from this and basically use to prevent it happening in the future? So these are the three main things that we're gonna concentrate on throughout our five discussions. So for the first one, we're gonna just talk a bit generally about ageism. And I want to say a couple of things first from the literature. From one large study, international study, it was found that ageism reinforces social inequalities and is more pronounced toward older women, that's most of us who are sitting here, poor people and those with dementia. Although not exclusively those people, but more than other people. I also had sent you an article, um, which did you get uh, send that? Thank you very much. A very interesting article about COVID and uh, how it was related and brought out so much, the whole question of ageism. And basically there were three main points that were brought out in this. So I just want to kind of reiterate these to you, that the public discourse during COVID-19 misrepresents and devalues older adults. This is what was felt by the researchers who were doing the study and also the, obviously the sample of people whom they interviewed. And they also looked through many, many um, news media, et cetera. Martin uh, Lagasse has done a huge amount of research in this area, and she has another study actually on, uh, on, on media and uh, what they disclosed about uh, ageism. The ageist attitudes circulating during COVID-19 make some people think that the pandemic is an older person problem. That's what also came out of the, all of the discourse. And the last one, the importance of intergenerational solidarity. So you see, if you stay in your house, Jean, and you don't have any people in it, um, you miss that intergenerational solidarity, which is important to maximize the support and connectedness of older adults during COVID-19. So I think those are the things I wanna start off the conversation with, and we can, I'd like to hear what you have to say now about ageism in general. Who's going to start off? If anybody wants to say anything, you're welcome to unmute yourself. Oops. Thank you very much. What is your name? Vivian. Okay. Vivian, yeah, now I see in the corner. Okay, uh, I, I'm very involved with seniors. I belong to Hopaso, Regroupement des Organismes pour René du Sud-Ouest. I'm also living, uh, well, I'm involved in the community, or I try, and I notice whenever there are projects, community projects, they always put seniors aside, and we're fighting it, but it's very, very hard, and, and it's at every level, of, um, I mean, even at the, at the municipal level, it could be a, at every level, and one experience was we had a park in our area, that we uh, want uh, was supposed to be uh, upgraded, and so we formed a committee. Some of our uh, senior members of the of the community of the area where I live, we got together with the help of a community organizer uh, to plan the park to be an intergenerational park. Anyway, today I'm not going to go into the details, but we we had lots of meetings and we had a team of UQAM who helped us, et cetera, to plan this, submitted it to the borough. We had meetings with the borough. And then finally, the, the park was upgraded, but the emphasis is on families and the seniors are all put aside. They have a game of uh, pétanque. 
that is not even finished. It's um, the there's no nice seats for seniors. They are they have the Adirondack chairs, which are not practical. They don't give it a thought, and there are two senior towers beside this particular park. So it makes me feel very bitter uh, towards uh, my municipality, my borough, for not have been more uh, thoughtful and take more time in listening to our demands. I mean, we had incorporated everything, all the level of, I mean, all the families, the children and the seniors, and yet the emphasis of the park is on families. Very interesting uh, comment. Uh, and also, also, I've not heard that before in all of the 21 uh, discussions that I've been having in the past. So. Thank you very much for bringing it. I hope you've also been complaining to the, uh, is it the city of Montreal who's been doing this? Well, it's my borough and they know me at my borough. And I, I've been actually, uh, I, I attended a workshop on uh, how to upgrade parks, etc., And I reported it and I was told to keep quiet because it upsets some of the employees from the borough. <laughs> so That's it's very right hard to no ages. Yeah, it's not easy, but I mean, we do have, and, and I had another experience again, where they don't listen, there's a project for seniors, a walking project, uh, create a circuit of um, walks to bring people, uh, to, to, to break the, uh, what do you call it, isolation, to encourage people to go out, and so we formed a committee through uh, Hopasson, and we had money from the borough, and we had somebody from an, um, from Prévention Sud-Ouest who uh, was to uh, organize the committee. And instead of consulting us seniors, he creates the the uh, the parcours, the circuits, the, 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 the paths, which are totally impractical and, I mean, not even interesting. And they didn't consult us. That's and terrible. we at the moment, we're very upset about it, but we're fighting it. Uh, but it was an example, and I think it's true, it's ignorant, ig ignorance. I don't think he did this on purpose, but I think he was under the pressure to produce something because he got the money. Yeah. But, well, that's a very good example. And uh, also, I have my advice to you is don't keep quiet I know. <laughs> ever. We have to speak out as seniors, and basically, otherwise, we become invisible and we become people who are vulnerable to being uh, discriminated against. So, I think you're on the right track. And uh, how do you spell the name of your organization? Well, it's Ropasom, R O P A S O M, okay. and it stands for Regroupement des Organismes pour une année du Sud-Ouest de Montréal. And we also, you may have heard about our project we did with the scarves, knitted scarves. Yes, and yes. Board. That's oh, us. you who did it. I, I knew I'd, I knew I'd heard of it before. That's good. So you're in Lachine area or somewhere. Uh, like no, it's uh, the Southwest Borough. Oh. Anyway, very nice to hear that example. It's an excellent example, and I'll add it to my report so that people can hear about it. Um, I think we have to move on now because we, I'm sure we've used our five minutes already on the discussion. So we'll move to the next discussion because. It will be a series of different discussions about different issues. And I'm sure you'll have lots and lots more to say, but you can always contact me after by email or in your feedback, etc. So ageism at a glance, where does it manifest itself? In the health area, very much so. This is a very uh, simplistic uh, cartoon here about how um, some of the health professionals, without realizing it, infantilize the people who come to their clinics, etc. And this is uh, actually a doctor. So the, doc the daughter brings her older mother, I'm sure it's happened to some of you possibly, and asks, and the doctor looks at the daughter instead of the mother and says, how is she doing today? And the mother answers, who are you talking to? If you are talking about me, then I can answer for myself, doctor. There's no need to ask my daughter. Um, I, think, I think that this happens really often, that 
professionals are often, without realizing it, sometimes perhaps uh, paternalistic, condescending, and infantilizing toward elderly people or older adults. And we have to be able to express our needs and desires freely and to be consulted and listened to without fear of triggering contempt. So basically, um, what do you think about this? Has it happened to any of you? We're going to discuss this particular issue now in the health sector. Or have you noticed other things in the health sector or in, through, in the pandemic, which you would say were ages? Yes. Who's going to start off the ball? Um, I think Marlene had her hand up before. She could maybe start. Marlene? Marlene, please come in. We'd like to see your face if you could start your video. All right, anybody else that wants to talk about it? My video's on. Can Linda. you not see? Oh, oh, there you go. Now I can see you, Marlene. Thank you. Okay, sorry. Maybe it was because I, I was wanting to support Vivian wholeheartedly because that's what I feel about this whole issue is that it's dealt with so that we're we're marginalized and it's all about the seniors and being old and frail and um, it's hard to we're mired in this concept of who we are and what we're about and um, it's very hard to get out of it and consulting us is not enough we have to be part of everything from the beginning and it's just not happening and I think partly it's because we've we we say that it's about um, older people but ageism is really about all of us it's it's about the way we regard age whatever age we are and um, younger people get categorized as well, you know, into millennials and Gen Xers and Zers and I don't know how many categories there are of people by age, but we don't, you know, we don't fight as a force together, you know, like it's organizations of older people always fighting the same things. And I think until we can see ageism as something that we all have to deal with, then we won't get anywhere. And in the hospitals, it's Mm -hmm. You know, this whole pandemic has just been a case of we're frail and uh, we need to be protected. And uh, it's very hard to get out of. I've never felt so old. Oh, that's very sad. Um, Jean, I think. Yeah, you had well, <laughs> I think a lot of people are not going to agree with what I'm going to say. I'm 87 years old, so I guess I qualify in as being old i think attitude is very important for us the 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 older generation and depending on our attitude when we deal with younger people uh, the response is a, is according to how we how we act if we act like uh, we're we're uh, we're weak we're they're debilitated or um, uh, we're not present. Of course, you're going to get some very negative reactions. I'm not afraid of speaking my mind. That's and good. I think that's what older people have to do. Now, I can understand that people suffering from Alzheimer's or something like that, it, it's very difficult for youngsters to deal with that, I would imagine. I think it takes an angel to live with with someone who has Alzheimer's, to tell you the truth, and uh, I, I know a few people who's a uh, few women whose husbands uh, have uh, have eventually died, but from Alzheimer's, and uh, I think they're saints for having endured that. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how to respond to that. Respond to that. Um, People are not saints. Let's face it, we're all human. We all have our frailties. And dealing with other frail, others' frailties can be pretty darn difficult. Yes. So I can, be under, I can understand young people sometimes. Well, you're right, though. I, we do have to speak up. I think that's what everybody's saying. And also, it helps if organizations work together, as, as um, Marlene put it. Um, 
right now we have, for example, uh, working on the issues of the people who live in the CHSLDs, the long-term care homes, which were, because uh, the pandemic exposed conditions which have been going on for a long time, which were absolutely disgraceful. And Canada looks like a disgrace, actually, in terms of our healthcare by, by, by reading the, 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 how the, the, how many deaths happened because of we weren't prepared and that we, we had, didn't have enough staff and we, ha we were missing 10,000 staff, which is huge amount, for example, in the pandemic in, in terms of healthcare. So- You know, Daphne, what happened in the CHSLD? I hate to say this, but it, it may turn out to be a good thing because yeah. in a way it woke up the politicians to the yeah. problem that was always there. Yes. And then my organization, which actually specifically aimed at fighting uh, for better conditions for the people who have been residents in the CHSLDs, and we've been functioning for 15 years. In fact, we won a famous uh, uh, lawsuit, class action suit in Charles Borromé, um, which took us 15 years to actually win it. But we did get $8.5 million, um, which is not we did not come to our organization. It came to the people who were suffering and were in terrible conditions within the uh, long-term care home. But that, we have been talking about it for years. So it, it, we had even sent recommendations to the ministry and actually met with the ministers, uh, the, the cabinet, some of the cabinet ministers and the minister herself. Uh, several times before the pandemic to say, look, the conditions are unacceptable. This is what's going on. So it, it wasn't like a total surprise to the ministry. It was, a, it, it was the, the, the pandemic that brought it out much more so because of the media. Social media, I think, finally got it that all of this was not and, and partly also, our, what our organization, Handicapped Life Dignity, did, we spent our time writing letters to the media and spending letters to the government and doing media programs, et cetera, about the conditions. But one thing that happened, talking about organizations get together, is it did um, engender a huge organization called the Collective Action COVID-19. I don't know if you know about that, um, which formed which within which there are, I think, 8 million seniors within that, but is really doing a lot of fighting for better conditions now in terms of home care, et cetera. So basically, I think um, it's also woken up the organizations to, to some extent that they are now realizing that they have to work together and to speak together in order to get some of these major problems done. The smaller problems too, it might work also. Um, Vivian, with your problem, if you got together with other organizations. We, have, we actually have seven partner organizations in my little organization um, now, and people are joining in. We did a petition against the fact that caregivers were removed from all of the long-term care homes from one day to the next. And I think it was due to 700 people actually signed that position. Uh, that petition, 700 caregivers, and we did actually manage to get the caregivers back. But had they thought about it, that maybe they should have trained those caregivers and not let them go just from one day to the next, we wouldn't have also had the situation. I don't think they even realized how much care the caregivers were giving at the time, which is also, all of these things were kind of part of the health sector problems that turned into ageism and ageist because it's how society treats older adult, adults is also in the world and not just in Canada, but everywhere uh, is also part of ageism. And we have to think about that and reflect on it and see how we can deal with that in better in a better way. So I think we have to go to the next issue now to see, because I wanted to try and talk about four different issues to, to get you thinking about these things. It's a little bit fast because an hour isn't very much time. So now we're looking at politics. So I mentioned the government now. And uh, I think, um, was it Vivian also talked about the government and uh, how they're not listening and how they're not treating the seniors well who did that 
magnificent project and spent so much time on it, etc. So um, politics is also an important uh, place where we have to look at ageism because they're the ones, the politicians who produce social policies, etc., which affect us all as seniors. And so this is a nice uh, little, uh, a lot of the myth is that seniors are costly to society. And it's, I've heard that since I came to Canada, I think, in 1967, that uh, seniors were being blamed for being very costly uh, with their pensions and with this and with the other. So this one lady says to the other friend, I'm tired of being told how I should contribute to society. We are constantly solicited to vote during election period, but the rest of the time we're ignored. It's the politicians who speak for us. And I have to say to you, it's true. Every single day in the past couple of months, I have been getting um, uh, messages from all of the liberal politicians uh, in the government, in the federal government, actually, as well, never mind the uh, provincial people who know me very well, um, about how we have to vote for them and how we have to uh, donate uh, give donations and how we have to and what their policies are and should I fill out a survey etc which is not necessarily a bad thing because at least I know what their policies are um, but the point is when it comes to actually them getting in are they doing all the things that they're promising and are they giving us the type of policies which are good for seniors um, and our contributions as seniors must be recognized by society. Uh, seniors are ex extremely social act active, whether they're working or not, whether they act as volunteers or caregivers and they participate in the broader economy. And uh, I think that one of the things that the pandemic showed was how much caregivers were actually giving us services. Because after they left, it was suddenly we heard about all this huge shortage of staff as well as some of the fact that people were afraid and some left and some died. But um, basically, it, it, didn't, it seemed like incredible that we could find 10,000 staff members missing in all the long-term care homes, etc. So, anything else to say about politics and the government? No, it's open to discussion. I see two hands. So, Loretta El Bosco, I'd love to hear from you. Yeah, hi. Um, I actually, my question, I, I had a question and it was, was related to this to a certain extent, mm -hmm. because both from a political standpoint and a social standpoint, we could approach it as North American culture does not put a lot of emphasis on seniors. And that's a, that's a, that's to me is a, is a very steep hill to climb. You have to climb it, but it's, it's a steeper hill to climb. However, and this is my ignorance on the topic, has there been a monetization of, for instance, what seniors, and let's say in Canada, uh, the seniors in terms of wealth, in terms of um, um, volunteerism and, and actual monetization, yeah. in terms <laughs> of caregiving, in terms of, because once you monetize, <laughs> then it makes a difference politically and it makes a difference in terms of how you approach different organizations, I would I would think more, I would think. Yeah. Because if not, then it just becomes seniors that are what we just saw from your slide, not giving back or, you know, the, the, just a drain and a cost to society. So mm -hmm. that's, that's kind of the first concept. And I don't know, I'm just putting it out as a concept. I would say Loretta that it has been done, many studies have been done actually actually that monetize uh, the value of caregivers and their time, et cetera, and, and the other things that you mentioned too. But I don't think it's been con um, probably pa conveyed to the public in a, because it, you know, there are loads of research that's done, but does it, uh, it's very difficult to get that research out to the public. So how do you communicate it, right? It's, it's all about communication. Absolutely. Yeah. I guess the other the other concept I had was we are we're, we've started, but there is this huge cohort of baby boomers that are 
coming along and with them comes totally generational 50s being born in the 50s in the 60s that kind of thing with them comes this whole generational about what they expect what they want and so I don't know if and because the cohort is so huge is there anything around that that either has been done or could be because those are the two concepts that that I and again it's my lack of understanding you know knowing um, about what's been done or not well I think I think uh, what the the baby boomer generation wants a more innovative housing solutions and alternative problems to this. I haven't seen a lot of studies on this that have shown exactly what people have said they want, et cetera, but it would be an interesting one actually for McGill maybe to do or other people to do. But the problem is the government vision to me because we, we wrote to recommendations uh, that we, not only did we show how terrible the situations were, we, we actually wrote what the proposals should be uh, to improve the situation in long-term care, for example. This is an example of, 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 of changing policy. Um, and we thought that they would take it up because you know, they want think people to be happy, but they, I find they have a very narrow vision. So you know, for them, these Maison des Ennes, was like the new innovative thing, but it wasn't really new and innovative and exciting to say the baby boomer generation or anybody else for that matter. Um, I think the other, I think the other challenge I had the opportunity um, when I was working of working a lot with government. I think the other challenge is that they're on a four year cycle. Yeah. Yeah. And as soon as you get into a four year cycle, you gotta, you gotta really push yourself in the, you know, the, the first year it's the other guy's problem before me, I, you know, and so they're careful if, yeah. if they're new. And then yeah. the second and third year, yeah, sure. So they're trying to go for re-election. And I think that, that that's a challenge with any four year cycle um, and, and work even in companies, you get caught if you have, for instance, um, at the top people that have four year cycles in their career, it's the same problem no matter what. So I think it's, it's a I challenge, think, but you I, I think in, I think we've had more innovative solutions across Canada, but in Quebec, I think our solutions have been extremely limited. It's been kind of limited, really, to certain models. It's been more more interesting in the private sector, but a lot of people can't afford to go into the private sector. So, you know, uh, the, they have to be there has to be better housing solutions. There is no question about that. And we could talk for hours about that. Yeah, thank you very much for the conversation. Thank you. Uh, John, did you still want to add some comments? I saw your name was up. Thank you very much, Loretta. That was interesting. John? Uh, we can't hear you. I, I think you have to put your unmute button on. Can you do it for him, Caitlin? Sorry, my, my fingers are shaking. I don't know. I have trouble <laughs> with my mouse. Don't worry. Um, no, I, I don't have any comments about about government involvement. Uh, um, the the comment I had was some things you said before, and I think it re we're we're victims a little bit of what happened maybe seventy years ago, and that was the uh, uh, the breaking up of family groups. For instance, uh, the atomic family mm -hmm. people. In the, in the old days, I'd say before the Second World War, there were the, the families were more closely knitted. Yes. Old people stayed at home, stayed with their children, uh, lived nearby. They were more respected in, in that respect, a little bit like the Chinese in a way, where the elders are respected. But the, the explosion of, uh, of business, if you wish, of travel, and people, families be, being broken up, for instance, husbands uh, having to work in, in distant uh, states or provinces. Um, in other words, the families, les familles ont, ont éclaté. Um, and I think that's what we're suffering from a little bit. And that now that the, the families are this, are this, um, spread spread out. Yeah. 
Um, well, partly that that is definitely part of the uh, of the issue, but it's not the whole of the issue. No, no. <laughs> I think there are many different pieces to it. We don't have time, unfortunately, in one hour to go through all these things because each one of them would be an interesting discussion or even research study in itself. Um, uh, can we go on to the next slide, please? Uh, the next cartoon, Caitlin. She's, she's trying, I can see that. <laughs> there you go. Okay. So I love this one. The technology one, refusal to use new technologies or the use of technology, how does ageism fit in with this? This gentleman says to the other gentleman, I don't feel like using this, it's too new, too complicated, I'm too old, it's for young people, not for me. Um, how uh, ageist is this as a comment, etc. And the other uh, fellow who actually looks uh, younger says, he, 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 he's happy with his computer. Um, so basically, what do you think about technology in terms of ageism? Has it been contributing to our problems? Has it been helping with our issues? How, is, how have we changed? Did you want to speak, Vivian? I can't hear you. You have to put your unmute. I had an experience teaching someone uh, to use a tablet and uh, that was disastrous. She wouldn't have anything to do with it. And I think because uh, the tablets or whatever, uh, uh, what a, well, not so much a computer, but the tablets are very hard to use, uh, especially if people are, are trembling or whatever. And, and they're very sensitive, the tablets. And actually, they're not designed for seniors. Nobody think about, you know, uh, the practical aspect, it's, you get all these modern features, but they don't think about the users. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, seniors um, are affected by this. I Some of them, of the, not saying all of them. Yeah, the buttons are sometimes very small uh, for people also to be able to use on the smartphones, for example. It's mm -hmm. a thing to have a smartphone, but it's 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 difficult for older adults to use it. You're right. Sometimes the problem with new technologies is that it was it's actually the programs are developed by young people with their own vocabularies. Absolutely. And the trouble is they don't know how to write succinctly. In fact, that's one of the problems with young people. I'm afraid they're badly educated in that Absolutely. respect. Oh, I'm sorry. No, they do no, not know no. how to express themselves clearly. As a result, you end up with these horrible uh, directives for uh, managing technology that's not understood by anybody outside of the, the sphere. I agree with the general comment, but I have to say, Jean, I've been giving also the same uh, lectures on uh, discussions on ageism with uh, high school students. And they feel as teenagers that they're also discriminated against uh, them by their, because of their age, et cetera, and, and stereotyped, et cetera. And so we have to be careful too on how we talk about our young people and treasure them. And uh, I, my granddaughter has been amazing to me because I never really had ever a, any kind of learning about the computer. I just kind of taught myself when I had to. They put, a, they put a computer in front of me when I became a professor and I had no choice. I just had to use it. So um, the thing is I find is I can remember one thing at a time. I can't remember necessarily 50 things at a time. And I think that that's what um, we have to encourage. We have to tell our young people that this is the case. So please don't tell me 15 things, tell me three things today. And I can learn that and do it, yeah. practice it, and then you can come back next week and tell me <laughs> another three things. And that's <laughs> quite I thing. agree. <laughs> um, and also the fact of, I agree with you that some of the buttons are very difficult for older people. They're not necessarily designed. And we have to perhaps participate in the design by <laughs> telling these people how they should be designing them. And we haven't done that very much actually. That's one of the things that we can do projects on and help. My, my, my largest uh, program of, uh, on Zoom before this one, actually, 
was one organization that had started off by giving a computer course in how to use Zoom at the beginning of the pandemic. And so I was kind of amazed that all of these people were able to use the Zoom and to come and enjoy it because <laughs> it left the other people, if they didn't use technology, very isolated. <laughs> And this is a big problem, basically. It's not really that difficult. It's that we're all so scared. I think we have that fear of technology. I was saying that to Caitlin at the beginning of the program. I'm, my biggest fear is that my Zoom isn't going to work. <laughs> and I'm the one who's actually supposed to be giving these sessions. So imagine everybody else who's actually trying to listen. And some people are even doing it by telephone. You can do it by telephone. And I really have to praise the people, really, who are trying, who haven't done it before, because it's not easy, but it's, it's become an essential part of our life. Even doing this Arrive Canada thing that we have to do, it's quite complicated. You have to download it and upload it and do God knows what with it. And we have to be able to do it in order to prove that we've been vaccinated if we want to travel. So all of these things are taken for granted by people like Caitlin, who's a young girl, and the rest of us have a hard time with it. But I use my daughter. I call my daughter, I call my granddaughter, and they are there for me. And therefore, I believe in intergenerational solidarity. Mm -hmm. We're going to move now to the last one, because you might not have thought about this so much. And I don't want to miss it. Most of the people who have listened to this lecture don't even think about it. So the last one is about our age philosophy, or also we could call it um, self-ageism. This lady said, I'm leaving for Cancun in two weeks. And the other lady says, oh, how brave you are. I'm too old to travel. So how are we ageist? Do we have ageist philosophies about ourselves? Um, you know, we all believe that we have to look younger. We look at the TV and it says, if you uh, have a facelift, if you do this, if you take so, so many drugs, you're all gonna be younger, et cetera. And so everybody feels they have to dye their hair blonde and they have to uh, look 25 years younger. And if you have wrinkles, you have to get rid of them with Botox, et cetera. Um, do, what kind of a philosophy do we have ourselves about our age? And the same applies to technology too. I, I see this as my big thing is, being able to see it as a setback perhaps in my life, having to use it, but it also has a lot of advantages that I've been able to reach people across the province. I wouldn't have been able to do that uh, without getting on a plane or a train, et cetera. It would have been so costly, so much time. So we have to see them as challenges, some of these yes. sets. So what are your th what's your thinking about how you treat yourself as older people? Older women, older men, older. Patricia had her hand up. If she'd like to speak now, I'd love to listen to her <laughs> <laughs> and see her if possible. Did you take any pictures, by the way, of our lovely group? Uh, I haven't, but if at the end, if everyone would like to stay and put their camera on, I could take a screenshot of everyone who joined today. It would be amazing. Yeah. Uh, no. Okay, my first comment, my comment goes back to you were talking about all of the solicitation and the things you're getting from the government, and I too have been getting that, but I have, and I've answered the surveys, and I always put in a comment at the very bottom saying that I refuse to vote for this liberal government as long as Justin Trudeau ignores Bill 96. Mm -hmm. I have called my local MP and left a message, he never called me back. I have got received um, uh, thank you, solicitation for donations because I have donated. So they always ask for more, right? And there's a telephone number at the bottom and I phoned the number and I told them, please refrain from sending me any more requests for donations. If you cannot think, if you do not think that the plight of the English community in Quebec is sufficiently important to warrant your support and until that then do not send me any any uh, solicitation and i haven't heard Good. one thing from anybody well bill 96 is a very uh, litigious uh, uh, law i think and uh, we have a lot to do about that i may be actually organizing some stuff in the fall around that 
So uh, maybe you can keep in contact with me via your email and uh, I will uh, recruit you to help me <laughs> do what I have to do about this Bill 96. Mm -hmm. I think right now everybody's on holiday, so uh, kind of have to wait till September for that. But I, I totally agree with you on the whole Bill 96 issue as it happens. Yeah. Um, and as for and as for the the feeling of you know ageism, the last slide there is your attitude. I honestly believe that right now I'm still, you know, I haven't reached eighty yet, but I just say I can do whatever I want to do, and I'm going to try it, and it doesn't matter. I'm doing it. Yesterday, I painted my driveway that blacktop by myself and I pulled out all those yeah. cans and I did the whole thing and I said it's not perfect but it's done and I'm happy so you. <laughs> so you guys are an amazing group you. you speak out you know the issues you actually uh speak out against in, uh, social injustices I think you should form a group and we could get a lot done <laughs> Well, I thank you very much for your I'd, I'd be for your happy to, I, I'd be happy to have you working uh, with me together. I think, was it Carita who wanted to speak? Somebody I also wanted to speak. Well, uh, yeah, I want to, you were, there was, well, it wasn't you, about, it was I think, about we, separate self deprecation yes. uh, in the previous cartoon. Yes. And I, I'm all for self deprecation. Uh, I write <laughs> stories for. Uh, with creative writing for, by the way, I'm going to do a bit of promotion here. McGill has this McGill for continuous um, lifelong learning. Oh yes. Um, you have to be over 55 years old to to participate in this group. But the writing um, group. I used to be in that group actually. Right, right. Yeah. And and I'm very active with it, uh, creative writing. So and uh, being self-deprecating. I have a whole story about uh, about ways people greet you in your old age. And one of the ways I dislike is when somebody comes up to me and says, my, you look great. My tendency to say is compared to what? Exactly. That's a good point, actually. It's a good answer. <laughs> Maybe we'll try it. Karita, yeah. did you have something you wanted to say before? I think it was you. No, I just wanted to say hi to you because we I used to work you. together. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Lovely to see you today. Um, yes. Nice to see you too. Thank you. Anybody else have any comments about, what about all the ads for being beautiful? If you look, all the people on TV who are seniors, do they look like us? Not necessarily. They've all got dyed hair. They've all had facelifts, et cetera. What do you think about that? <laughs> You had a comment. I, I just want to say something. You know, when that, um, that picture about traveling, yes. um, and they say, uh, one of the ladies said, I'm too old to travel. It just yes. remind me of a story. I mean, not a story. Something happened in, in our home about a year ago. So our toaster oven broke. So I told my husband that I need a toaster oven. And then he went on to studying uh, his different product. And he came home with an inverter uh, oven. I don't know anybody know that. An inverter oven, it's, it's a microwave, it's a steamer, it's an oven, it's a grill. And, and it also does the different combination like the microwave and, 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 and oven and this and that. So it looks very complicated. So, so I came, he came home with that piece of equipment, cost over $450. But all I said is, I just need a toaster. It's only $30, <laughs> it's just a toaster. And then I said, uh, and I'm almost 70. Please don't make me learn something new like that. He yeah. was so disappointed. I was, I was pouring cold water on him for a the, for the couple of months. And I feel so bad afterward because after I start using it, I love it. Oh, so I think so, so at the end of the day, sometimes it's me blocking, yes. blocking myself to advance. So I, I, as a senior, as a senior, I just want to remind myself and everybody 
sometimes I am putting the limitation on myself yes. from advancing. Yes. So um, when I saw that cartoon, it totally brought me back that picture. We mm -hmm. almost got a divorce. <laughs> That's so funny. Because he, he was so kind. He was so considerate. He was thinking that our oh, microwave is almost gone. You know, the toaster oven is finished, kaput. So get something that, that, that we can use for a longer time. So mm -hmm. he, full good intention, but it's me who was stopping. And now I have learned, hopefully I will remember this lesson that when something new comes up, before saying no, or before saying learning it, maybe I, I should give myself a chance there you go. to try it. And yeah, that's, that's all I want to say. That's actually, I'm one of, I, I just want, that was wonderful. I, I just want to go through now the five points that I made about how we could try to kind of uh, uh, prevent ages. And if somebody does uh, give us an ageist comment or whatever, or society does treat us in that way through the beliefs, attitudes, what we can do. So empowerment is found to be the best antidote to ageism. And I think everybody who spoke today and probably all the participants are empowered people. And maybe you could try to pass this empowerment on to others who are disempowered and not feeling empowered. Speaking and empowerment means speaking out about mistreatment of older or younger adults, not remaining silent when it's observed in any way. Uh, making partnerships, as, as we mentioned before, and making alliances with other organizations to make a stronger advocates. And last thing, uh, the next thing is what you just mentioned, seeing our setbacks as challenges and taking on realistic new challenges continually. For me, this was a big new challenge to be able to go across the uh, whole province by Zoom. And yet we've done it so far in 21 different places and, and to many, many people, and it's been great. Uh, checking ourselves for self-ageism and not making excuses for not taking on new challenges, as you, you just said so nicely. Continuing to learn new things and to grow, which uh, Jean mentioned, in spite of setbacks and health issues, which we have continually as we get older, chronic health issues, et cetera. Turning bad treatment into good treatment of older adults by raising our voices collectively. We have to raise our, our voices and not remain silent when we do see these things, even though we hate it. And we have to keep on. We have to be a pain in the butt which is what everybody sees me as, but I don't care. Intergenerational solidarity, last thing, helps to prevent isolation and ageism, building relationships with our grandchildren or students and volunteers to help one another. This teaches the younger generations to understand and respect the older adults and their needs and to be more kind, generous and patient. It also teaches older adults to understand and respect teenagers. So those are some of the few points that I brought out, which can, we can use now. And um, I just want to end by, before we take our picture, to thank everybody for your patience, because we are, I think we're a little bit over time, but we have done pretty well in an hour and five minutes. Each of the topics that we discussed, we could have discussed for a whole hour. But thank you for letting me introduce this topic to you and giving you a little bit of uh, things to think about. And I really enjoyed seeing your smiling faces and that you're all still here after this horrible pandemic, even though it's not over yet, still continuing a bit. But we all, I think we're all feeling a little bit better when we are vaccinated. So make sure that you stay strong, you get vaccinated, double dose as much as you can, and that you managed to come through this setback as a new challenge. When you look at yourselves, what you've been able to do. I find it in my organization, when I look back, how much we've done actually more in the pandemic than we actually did before, I think. Um, because we cut down on all the time we spent going to meetings, coming back from meetings, etc. So, you know, there's always a good and bad side to everything. 
And thank you particularly to Caitlin and to McGill for putting this on and to the observatory for designing the program. We would like some feedback. I had sent you all, I think, uh, a very brief feedback thing, giving some ideas. You've all given me your ideas, but I'm sure you have a lot more. So feel free to write them down briefly. You can send them to Caitlin, who can organize them and send them to me in a summary. Uh, and uh, if you have some later on, you can still continue sending me ideas because I think uh, the more ideas we have, the more we work together. I love meeting you. And you probably are the liveliest group I've had during the 21 sessions. So thank you very much. <laughs>